Growing up in China, one of the many developing countries on Earth, I had a chance to witness a lot of tremendous changes happening there. Generally, in a good way, and probably with the development of economy being the most obvious one. As we can see on the headlines, even here in the States, about China's GDP this year and China's GDP that year. But today, however, what I want to share with you is actually about a problem that China's been facing, and hopefully also a solution to ameliorate that issue. But before you hold your breath, waiting for some first-hand dark secret of Chinese government, as many of my American friends usually expect once I told them, you know there is a big problem about China? And they'll go like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm afraid I have to let you down again. Because this problem is actually one faced by many other developing countries as well. And sometimes even developed countries like U.S. In the year of 2000, the very beginning of this century, if you go to visit Shilipu, a small village located in the southeast part of China, you would most likely come across with a bunch of kids, running in the field, swimming in the river that went through the village, climbing the trees and rocks in the surrounding mountains, and bathing in a three-meter tall stream, which was like a gigantic waterfall to them. And there was me, laughing and enjoying to the best I could, without any worry or concern, like how I was going to explain to my dad why I didn't go to school that day. <laughs> a process usually ends in me being whipped by a twig taken from the tree in front of our house. And even though the tree can't offer the weapon, but I really couldn't explain, blame it, blame it on him, on it, for just standing there. And the twigs in my dad's hand is not a problem I'm going to talk about either. I love you, Dad. <laughs> so, after graduation, with this personal and deeply felt love towards nature, reckoning economics, politics, business being too complicated and unpredictable for my tastes, I took the easy path, decided to become a physicist. <laughs> trying to understand the underlying laws and patterns of nature. However, before I get to know the nature I grew up in, the surrounding itself has started changing. This is a picture I took from the top of the mountain I used to run around, with a bird view of my small hometown. As you can see, a lot of the fields are replaced by houses which I didn't quite like, but hey, that shouldn't be the serious problem that many countries are facing. Because as population grows, um, it's certain that people will take more land to use. However, if you take a closer look, you will start to reveal the secret. The air. During the past decade, Huangyan, the district where I came from, has transformed into the city of plastic modeling in China. So whenever I see a plastic bottle at the bottom of which says Made in China, actually a special feeling would arise. Because, hey, it might be from my hometown. And it just came all the way here like I did. But with this vastly expanded business and the boost of economy came the pollution. As you can see, the air quality is noticeably worse in the more industrialized area in the right compared to the less developed area in, to the right, to the left. And that's not just something happening in Huangyan, but in many other big cities like Beijing. These are a group of photos taken from at the same time every day throughout the November last year. As you can see, at a certain point, it's just hard to see far enough to drive around. And those two tall buildings you are looking at, those are not some chimneys of coal plants. These are the World Wing Summit Wing Hotel, located at the center of the city, where people actually live and hang around every day. And for those places with actual coal plants, what does it look like? Well, this is it. It's simply hard to imagine 
how people's life would be living in such a place. So, knowing all of this, I began my senior research as an experimentalist with my then supervisor. Started my journey as a material, as a material science, as a physicist major. At that time, before I got to decide which topic should I choose, I started to struggling. Is there a way to revive the once great environment we lived in? And as a generation grew up with a cell, growing up with a cell phone. I took out mine and started googling how to improve environment. The first entry came out as planting trees. Well, I doubted whether my dad is going to hold up his mighty twig again once he knows that I'll quit school and plant, start planting trees for the rest of my life. Even though that could be very meaningful, but what else? What else can change the environment and people's life? While looking at the cell phone, I realized that, compared with my childhood, another thing that has greatly changed the way, the way people live is exactly what's in my hand: the cell phone. Together with computer and internet, which are mostly based on chips made out of silicon, a material we didn't pay attention to, because before extraction, it is merely sand. But after the Discovery and application of this new material, the whole world has to become different, as it's evident that I believe many of you right now are having a cell phone in your pocket. I hope, not in your hand. <laughs> so, could new materials be the answer? Well, to start with, if we can find a more environmentally friendly material to replace plastic, my hometown could be a lot different. And if we can find a material to build solar cells, so that it's more cheaper and more efficient to generate alternative energy compared to what the traditional coal can bring us, or even to build every housing to generate its own electricity, Shanxi, Beijing, or the whole world could be different. With this in mind, I started my journey. Of the material discovery in the traditional way, where、well, you actually make all the materials and then you test on their properties to see if achieves your goals. At that time, my job was to find a material that has better photovoltaic efficiency, which basically means better ability to harvest the solar energy, and that was actually a job passed on to me by a student who's already graduated. And that, which means there's a lot already been a lot of time put into it. But later, I found that in order to use your innovation to find out to find new materials in urgent need fast, there are two rules you have to follow. First, you can't be fast, and second, you can't be innovative. Because even just to substitute one element in a system, you have to spend months. Starting for researching for the method of fabrication of that material, and then the characterization just to make sure you make the actual material, and last but not least, test on the properties to see if you get what you want. And sometimes during during the synthesis of the material, you have to be really slow on purpose, just to make sure it reaches a stable condition. And all of these. Are just for one potential candidate. There is no guarantee that you will find the desired pro property in that material. So, because opportunity cost is so huge, people really can't go wild and open when choose initial system to study with. At the end of my senior year, we had some discoveries, but it's still so far away than finding a material that's actually applicable. But what about the environment? Was it waiting for us? Well, all I can tell you is that after my graduation, people check their weather app every morning, like usual. But not only to get the temperature and the precipitation, but also the air quality, just to make sure if they need to wear masks like these kids when just hanging out with friends. 
And it turns out that the average time span it takes from materials discovery to application is 20 to 30 years. So after graduation, graduation I started wondering again, is there a faster and more innovative way for the, mater for the discovery of materials? Could I just Google it? Yes. What should I be looking for? Google itself. This tech giant has excelled by providing people with information using a large database and a huge capacity of supercomputer. So can we utilize this astronomical computing power to accelerate the whole process of materials discovery? Well, the answer is yes. And that's high throughput computational material design, the research area I'm working in and also what brought me here across the globe, because UNT actually hosts a world-leading research groups in this area. So, how does it look like? Well, most of you should be familiar with this table, the periodic table. Basically, everything we've ever seen or touched is just a combination of these elements. So what if I tell you that we can just pick out whatever elements we like and find out its potential property? Well, that could be amazing. What about those months you were just talking about to substitute one element in one system? Well, that's when supercomputer and the materials modeling comes in. As it turns out, many of the materials we are interested in are crystals with repetitive unit cells like this. And since we've already know most of the information of the elements, so if, what if we can find a way to simulate the material, use a supercomputer to build models using these repetitive unit cells? By repetitive, I mean if you move around the unit cells, you can actually reproduce the whole structure of the material and then predict its possible properties. Well, that should be interesting, because you don't actually have to make the material. You will know that in beforehand. And what's, more, what's better would be if we have a database that's already included all the possible combinations of materials. Well, that should be something. Just imagine, whatever you're looking for, just put it in a search box like Google and just hit a button, you will know the answer. Isn't that amazing? Well, of course, this is ultimate blueprint. <laughs> we haven't gone there yet. But sure, there should be some challenges. And to start with, the methodologies we use to simulate the material's property using these fundamental unit cells, they are not 100% accurate. And the computing power it takes to do the calculation for a complicated material could be really expensive. But despite all of these challenges, our group, together with many other collaborators around the world, has begun this project. Where are we now? Let's Google it. A-Flow. A-Flow is an online materials property repository with an aspiration for automatic flow for materials discovery. Right now, it hosts a database of over 1.3 million materials compounds and 120 million calculated properties. And they are still growing as we are talking right now. So let's do our magic this time, trying to grab a few elements and see what it looks like. Maybe start with the most common carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. Well, this seems like together with silver, they could be forming an interesting material. Let's check it out. These are just some collaborators we are working with. Um, this is a repetitive unit cells of these specific materials, which give you all the configuration information. And if you scroll down, 
you can actually find the calculation details, which includes how much time it takes to run the calculation and what kind of software we are using. And also the properties of the material, which is a, pur which is a purpose. You can find the size, the density, and thermodynamic, magnetic, and electronic properties, which are crucial for finding their potential applications. And remember, this is just one of the over millions of compounds we've already had in the database. Since it's globe accessible, so our colleagues can share our findings, and those experimentalists, they can actually find the most promising candidates before going around and doing experiments blindly, which is going to save them a lot of time, like months, years, like I did. So, 15 years ago, I was that kid, running around my hometown, breathing and catching every beautiful scene in my eyes. And after those rapidly developing years, things have started to change. And here I am, across the globe, not to try to reverse the industrialization or slow down the progress of human society, but only to help it achieve a more sustainable way, sustainable way to the develop, for the development. We the only hope that after another 15 years or many more years to come, kids can still just go out, live and experience the wonderful nature that the planet has, give us, has given us. And just remember, we used to distinguish and mark the progress of our human society using the material that was prevalent during the time. Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and now the Information Age, which can also be described as the Silicon Age. With high-throughput computational material design, aided by the ever-improving methodologies and computing power, I'm confident that the next whole new era where human and the nature live in a much better harmony would be just around the corner. Thank you.